So throughout the day, we've heard about you know unicorns. We've heard about early stage investors. We've heard about the good, the bad, and the ugly in DC. Um, but now, you know, most of the companies are not going to make it to blockbuster status without the help of a strategic investor. There are exceptions to the rule, but for the most part, we would not have seen, for instance, BioNTech's mRNA vaccine get to global distribution if they had not had a strategic partnership with Pfizer. And that's probably the best known example in recent times. So um, today we are thrilled to have with you three um, highly experienced and supportive members of Arizona's biotech community um, who are going to share a little bit about investment from the strategic perspective. Um, so hopefully we'll see more of those relationships coming forward in Arizona. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to our moderator, Randall Schulhauser. Um, thank you, Randy. Well, thank and you, Joan. please kick it <laughs> off. Thanks, Joan. Well, actually, for this, I'm, what I'm going to start off with is just have our panelists up here uh, introduce themselves. So first, Jotna. All right. So I'm Jotna, and a lot of people get confused with my name. So if you ignore the Y, it's fanatic. Uh, so <laughs> let's get that out of the way. Um, I'm the global head and vice president of uh, research and development for Roche uh, Tissue Diagnostics. It's also now called the Pathology Lab. Um, so the focus is on precision medicine, uh, personalized healthcare, diagnostics, and oncology. Andy. Uh, Andy Muller. Um, I am with Exact Sciences. If you're not familiar with Exact Sciences, you probably are with our uh, biggest product, which would be Cologuard. Um, so we are all about eliminating cancer and the suffering that it causes. So Cologuard is for screening for uh, colorectal cancer. And then we have another product um, that's fairly common, uh, commonly used, which is Oncotype DX Breast, which is for women who have early stage breast cancer, helps them to understand if chemo will be helpful to them or not. Uh, I lead business development for the screening side of our business. We also have sort of a post-diagnosis side, uh, which a colleague leads. So Randall Schulhauser at Medtronic, uh, business development, strategy, and innovation. Um, I'm going to go and say that uh, I get reminded this every now and then, but uh, I've got the coolest job at Medtronic. Um, very loosely, my uh, job description is figure out how medicine is going to be practiced five, ten years from now, and help Medtronic do things today to be relevant five and ten years from now. So if you're a shareholder in Medtronic, you can either thank me or blame me or whatever <laughs> for things. But um, you know, it's, uh, you know, I'll just say it's a challenge um, at times. I've been at Medtronic since 1985. Um, with that, it's been a, you know, a long ride. Um, I said I started when I was seven years old. Um, <laughs> you know, with that, I've had the privilege to travel the world and live a few places um, around the world as well. Um, so first off, you know, partnering with strategics, you know, it means many things to many people. And Gatsnia, you know, I was wondering if you could define what that means to Roche. Yeah, a great question. Um, you know, there was a time when you partner with um, strategics based on technology. The power of technology or something that complements what you don't have. Um, the times have shifted now. That's clearly important. But even more important now is how do we take that technology and develop in a way that more and more people can benefit from it? And it's become a question of reimbursement, market access, adoption, all of that combined. So now when we look at um, strategics or other you know, partners that we would like to partner with, acquire, license, what have you, it has a broader view of it versus, you know, gee, the technology is really good and this is something that's missing, let's go acquire them. So it's taken on a more holistic view of the healthcare eco ecosystem that we take into account um, you know, when we look at partners. Andy, what does it mean to exact sciences? 
Yeah, so for exact, it's, it's a lot about creating optionality for the future. Um, sometimes that's uh, just creating a belt and suspen suspenders approach to some of the work that we're doing internally. Um, sometimes that could be just looking out towards the future, right, five to ten years from now and mm -hmm. saying, hey, we think that this is going to be important for our future offering, right? Uh, how could we work with, uh, with another partner who knows more about, about this or we think is going to be well placed for the future? Um, and we can place some small bets there. Um, some of the other ways are just, you know, these are interesting companies who are making interesting uh, inroads in a space that we think will be important or might feed into a future product for us. Right, they, these are a couple of the areas that, that Exact tends to focus on. Good. Well, for Medtronic, um, I'm just gonna share with you that you know, it's a large corporate entity. So I spend six months of the year um, working on a strategic plan um, with our business partners. And then the other six months of the year litigating our annual operating plan that was dictated by our strategic plan. So, um, you know, the partnering with strategics, um, I'll go and say has to have a direct tie to our strategic plan. Um, we push it out looking 10 years into the future. And with each one of our businesses, we start to define what, what area do we want to be when we grow up or what do we want to be in 10 years time? And with that, we start to say that, um, um, you know, how can we go and fulfill that, um, that uh, aspirational goal? And I'll go and say that we take, um, I'll just say, a complete agnostic look at that. We, we aren't just looking externally. Because we are a large entity, we have 30 separate businesses. We'll also look internally. So should a business be partnering with an internal business? And it might be to access their technology. It might be to access, uh, say, at a unique uh, distribution channel. And these other aspects to go with their business. And then I'll also say that um, when we are looking internally, um, I'll just say it's, uh, it might be a sum of three that's necessary. The one plus one is maybe the internals, the two businesses within Medtronic, but then there's this third component that we're missing to, to realize that value that we're trying to achieve. And I'll say that's in the essence, um, you know, the partnering with strategics. So it's looking in, I'll say, at all shapes, all causes, all where. Uh, for where that uh, partner can be. Rani, could I add one yes. point on that? As you were talking, it triggered my thinking. So I don't want to leave you with the impression that we only look at the holistic you know, aspect of access and adoption. Um, in our sequencing area, for instance, we have acquired a lot of companies, and most of them haven't yet come to fruition. But the technology was in early stages, and it takes time to mature them. And companies like Medtronic, I used to be at Medtronic for many, many years, so familiar with what Randy's saying. Um, it takes incubation time. So it depends what stage company you acquired. But you have to go in with your eyes open, right? Sometimes we acquire a company, and then uh, seniors, you know, our, our executives get frustrated when they don't see the output. So I think that clarity has to be there that we're acquiring it for this reason and it's gonna take X amount of time. So I think if that transparency is there, it just becomes much easier for that company that you acquire to flourish, as well as setting the right expectations. Yep. So sort of to build on that, um, I think in Medtronic, we're sort of trapped in the rule of threes at the moment. So we're a $30 billion company. Um, we spend about $3 billion annually on our organic um, R&D or organic innovation. And we spend, um, if you look at it uh, maybe over time, about $3 billion on inorganic activity. And that can be strategic investments, um, so small equity stakes in um, smaller companies, or outright acquisition. And those total up to about $3 billion. So what I'm trying to get across is that there's a bit of a balance between organic and inorganic. And I'll say traditionally, strategically, we look at the organic spend as being more, I'll call it incremental or derivative type of innovation. And then the inorganic side as being our disruptive or step function innovation. That's where we're really going to get, I'll say our future drivers of growth uh, tends to be from our inorganic type of innovation or acquisition. Mm -hmm. 
Andy, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, for exact, um, it, it's a little bit of both, right? I, I wouldn't say uh, that it fit, fits so neatly into, into one camp or the other. Um, Thrive is one such acquisition where, uh, so Thrive is similar to Grail, uh, those of you who are mm -hmm. you know, um, trying to figure out what I'm talking about here. <laughs> uh, so multi-cancer early detection, right? The idea okay. is you take a blood draw and from that blood draw you can screen for all sorts of types of cancers. Now um, Thrive had done some really interesting promising work in, uh, in sequencing, right? And Exact has done tons of research in methylation. Right, and so the, the thought was by combining some of these efforts, um, we might be able to come up with a test that is much more sensitive, much more specific. And that tends to be the model that we follow is a lot more, hey, is one plus one equal three in this case, mm -hmm. right? We, we do spend a fabulous amount of money on R&D as our uh, shareholders remind us frequently, mm -hmm. um, but we also tend to, um, tend to buy in places where we feel like we're not gonna be able to hire uh, effectively enough. Okay. Mm -hmm. Andy, do you have strategic partners outside of the life sciences? Um, you know, we, not a lot. Um, we do, uh, so last fall we did an acquisition of a company that does a lot of rare disease testing, right? Hereditary cancer testing, uh, other hereditary diseases. I think that's going to pull us in some really interesting directions in terms of collaborations with uh, patient advocacy groups, right? We can start to do um, some really fascinating research that, that drives to what are the actual precursors to cancer, um, at least on the, on the hereditary side. Um, and then we do also a bit of community work just in terms of, you know, there are these huge gaps in getting people screened for cancers, right? Um, and so we have started to do a lot of, a lot of grants and more collaborative work, um, just trying to drive greater utilization and adoption of cancer screening. Because we just, when you identify cancer at an early stage, it's so much more survivable. Katya, what about Roche? Do you invest outside of life sciences? Absolutely, we do. Um, so Roche is the number two healthcare company in the world after J&J, where I worked also. And um, you know it's composed not only diagno of diagnostics but also Gen and Tech is part of Roche, and there is another big pharma component in in uh, in Germany on small molecules. So Roche um, has um, uh, what we're trying to do is combine diagnostics with therapeutics, and looking at companion diagnostics, our personalized healthcare solutions, our precision medicine where you identify a specific mutation in a specific tumor in a person and try to pair a therapy that goes with it. And so that's where the personalized aspect comes, be it checkpoint inhibitors or some other uh, receptor-directed uh, molecules. The non-life sciences part comes in AI, so artificial intelligence, we're looking at uh, pathology slides. We are identifying uh, the tumor microenvironment. What's going on? Is there angiogenesis? Is there T lymphocyte infiltration? What kind of markers are expressed? So that we can have um, a high throughput system and a more precise system. Right now, pathologists, they look at the slides and you know some things, they, they're very good. They're very specialized in the kind of cancer they look at, but some things are Co, for, for instance, co-expression of say two and two antigens side by side, they could miss something. So artificial intelligence and creating these deep machine learning models help us with identifying these rare events and also help us with high throughput analysis. So we are doing a lot of work on that end so that we can have scanning um, you know, what radiology used to be many years ago, that's where digital pathology is today. And so having the right images, the DICOM standardization, and then building AI on top of it so that we can combine life sciences with all the new, you know, the ground truth that is out there. The second piece where um, medical devices intersect with life sciences is in drug delivery. 
so Genentech, you know, they have a lot of biologics that need to be given in a doctor's office or in the hospital. But think of a cancer patient who's gone through so much, and then they have to go back to the doctor's office over and over. And that's hard. That's very hard. So these sub-Q devices that they can put on their arm um, delivers the drug over a period of time at a slow rate. They can walk around. They can watch TV. So these are like improving quality of life and ensuring that there's compliance in, in receiving the therapy. Because a lot of times, people are like, I feel better. I don't want to go. You know, just because there's not enough strength to do that. So that helps that aspect, too. So these are two examples, but um, robotics, and there are so many other things that are also happening. Yeah. So at Medtronic, I guess, similar to Roche, um, I guess one of the very active areas is about uh, data, 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 AI, AI, AI. And uh, I'll just say that uh, Medtronic has a portfolio of strategic partnerships with the usual suspects that sort of come to mind. You know, you think of Amazon, you think of Google, you think of Apple and so forth. And we have these relationships. And you might be asking, you know, why are we trying to do this? Well, uh, I'll just say if you thought of Medtronic, maybe what we were, um, we had this brand of being a therapy delivery company. So as a therapy delivery, I'd say we were somewhat uh, you know, trapped within the four walls of um, the OR or the cath lab or something of that nature. And I'll go and say that um, the strategy going forward is to get beyond the four walls. So we think of it more of a workflow type of strategy where you start with the, the integration of the diagnosis um, with the preoperative plan, um, getting a little more personalized as opposed to the one si size fits all for that individual patient. Then in the, uh, the OR, having, I'll call it these interoperative adjustments, you know, things don't necessarily happen as they were pre-planned, and being able to adjust on that. And then outside of the OR, um, what is the, you know, the post-operative follow-up and the optimization and creating a feedback loop into that pre-planning part. And that's really a, a, I'll call it a fundamental strategy that we are building um, as we speak and seeking partners there to go and execute. Yeah, and uh, so Exact is, is thinking about a lot of the same things, right? So we, all of our tests require a physician's order. However, um, I'm sure all of you have seen the commercials, right? Like it's very patient driven. And so uh, me, much of the work that we are trying to do uh, outside of improving the tests is how do you improve the patient's relationship with the test, right? Uh, how do you make collection easier, not for Cologuard, but more for uh, some of the, uh, the blood-based tests, right? Uh, how do we make it efficient, especially for those patients who are driving from rural areas, right? How do you make sure that it's going to be a really efficient drive into town, uh, that they will be able to get all of the follow-up testing that they need, that they'll be able to find uh, someone who can effectively read that PET CT, some, you know, and so on and so forth. We are in the business of building tests, right? We can't do all of those things. Um, and so we are often looking for the right partners who are going to help us improve that patient experience. Yeah, I, I want to add one thing. Thank you for bringing that up. And it's, it isn't a plug for Roche. But, um, you know, we are developing what's called a tumor board. And why I bring this up, because someone that's close to you, a friend or family member, in case they are suffering with cancer, what this is, you probably have experienced that coordinating that care is so hard, right? You don't know which oncologist to go to, then there is a radiologist component, then there is the surgery component. Should we give therapy first, surgery after, or surgery first? Should we debulk? Should we shrink the tumor? There's so many questions, right? And so this, what this tumor board in hospitals does is they have that consultation, but they don't have enough data. Right? So what Roche is doing, what we call the Navify platform, help them navigate, it, it's to incorporate, for instance, the tumor information be from pathologists, or sequencing, publications, any new drug that's coming, clinical trial, anecdotal publications. They pull all of that together and they can present that. That's the ultimate goal to the tumor board in the hospital. Now think, imagine the power of this. When they look at it, they can make better clinical decisions. The whole idea is to provide that clinical decision support. 
And through that, if we make their lives easy, an oncologist just has to quickly look at it and make a decision versus think, spend hours, and they don't have time. They go from patient to patient to patient, and what's missing here? And if we can collate and curate this information for them, for that specific patient, think how far this is gonna go. And that's if that saves even a single patient, it's well worth it. So we are working on those uh, pieces of information and putting them in the Amazon cloud, on premise, et cetera, so that it's accessible anywhere. And it's not for patients who are from rich countries who can afford. Think of democratization of this, this whole approach. So, you know, in a, in a less um, fortunate or richer country, uh, patients have a right to live also, right? I mean, just because they're there, they shouldn't die. And if we can collate that information and a consultant here can look at it, imagine what difference that would make in their clinical trial, in their clinical, um, you know, outcomes, as well as uh, the protocols that are going to be applied, et cetera, et cetera. So looking at the entire continuum of patient journey and seeing where can we affect a change and then try to put the pieces together so it helps the clinician make the right decision. So I just wanted to throw that out. It's not about Roche. It's about, you know, when you know someone, ask that question. What about the tumor board? Andy, what's the best way for a life sciences company to foster a relationship with a strategic investor? <laughs> Buy you a beer? <laughs> <laughs> That's a start. <laughs> you know, uh, I think it's uh, being creative, but not, not too creative. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, we, a lot of the really fascinating discussions that I've had recently with, uh, with companies that have come forward are kind of around areas where we feel like we have a unique access to sample or a unique, um, we have something unique, but we're just not in a position to capitalize on it, right? Um, and so taking some of these just orthogonal approaches, right, if, if we can partner with somebody who has this unique knowledge um, in a way that allows us to create some option value for the future, I think that's, um, that's a really good one. Um, I have seen some people who are perhaps a little bit too creative, though, where they say, you know, Cologuard is for, uh, for older people, so are mm -hmm. you interested in selling some bedpans? Uh, oh. or, or effectively something like that, right, where you go, please never call me again. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, Roj. Um, what, do, what do we look for? Um, I think... In life, I really believe everything is trust. So when you meet a partner, culture is so important, right? And, and yeah, of course, we're going to look for um, technologies or companies that help complement what Roche does or fill a gap that we don't have or give us a competitive advantage. And we are looking out in the future, too. You know, So all of those factors are standard factors. But I feel like a company that's... Um, understands what the need is, understands the market. It's, it's not like a hammer trying to look for a nail. Understands where, you know, the, how the business is, and then come to us. But I feel like whenever I've done partnerships, and I used to run BD at Medtronic for a couple of years, um, I look for that kind of cultural fit. That is really, really important, because if you can't trust your partners, it doesn't go far. And if the partner tries to oversell, we have to be careful about that too, right? So it's appropriate due diligence. Of course, it has to fit the business case and the ROI and that everyone does that. But then what makes one acquisition successful over the other, um, uh, over the others are some of these factors I feel like, you know. So building on your trust element, mm -hmm. um, I'm just going to speak not necessarily for Medtronic, but me personally. Um, I look at it from more of a relationship mm -hmm. kind of pr perspective. It's not a one and done. You know, you've made a, you know, a, an introduction to me, and then that's it. Um, mm -hmm. I look at it as being, you know, that was the first stage of a longer process. Um, I like to think that there's time and distance associated with the. Um, uh, your startup company uh, or your great idea, um, it might not be immediately obvious that it fits right into what we are looking for at this particular moment, 
But lo and behold, um, you know, our next strat planning cycle and so forth, we start to think about things in a little different light. And I remember being introduced to a little company and what their idea was, and that starts to maybe become interesting um, for me. And I'm just saying in my career, um, it's been very, very rare where someone introduced themselves to me and suddenly, you know, we are on uh, looking to get married at Medtronic. I'm going to go and say that any of those examples and so forth had time and distance associated with them. So I'll just say that's probably my little piece of advice uh, for life sciences companies. Maybe not um, how you partner with all strategics, but at least if you're thinking of partnering with me through Medtronic, think about that. Yeah. No, it's, it's a great point. I think many of the really interesting strategic uh, relationships, uh, relationships that you can strike are rarely immediately obvious, mm -hmm. right? It, it takes a little bit of brainstorming, being uh, straightforward about what you're, what you're looking for mm -hmm. um, and what you have to trade, uh, and then just being creative and, and staying plugged in occasionally. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can you share um, with us your most recent example of strategic partnering at Roche? Our re most, I mean, we in sequencing, there are many, but what I can think of strategic partnering, we don't, we think it's a company and another company, but it's with hospitals, right? Uh, it's a strategic partnership. It's not just partnering with another company or acquiring a technology. Um, or some, something of that nature, because we are looking for the ground truth. And ground truth means what we are observing and we are creating an algorithm for actually matches with patient outcome. Because we could identify something, a mutation. A mutation in itself means nothing. It means something, don't get me wrong. Of course, there are a lot of therapeutics and billions of dollars being spent on that. But at the end of the day, it has to make a difference in outcomes. Right? And so for us to be partnering with the hospitals to see the kind of treatment they got, their diagno diagnosis, and how that outcome was, was uh, affected by all these pieces coming together, and partnership to look at what the outcomes were. It's very hard to get outcomes. We have over 250 pharma partnerships, and we have to firewall because we have Genentech. And, um, and, and the patients are de-identified, obviously, but we never get to know what happens. So we have a CDX, a companion diagnostics, but then we don't have the data because we firewall. But with these partnerships, we can look at what we diagnose, the kind of therapy they got, what happened. And that, those kind of partnerships, I feel like, feel like are even more important, and with academics as well, because that's where the cutting edge is. So th that's, what, that's what comes to mind. Otherwise, you know, we acquired Nanopore and a few companies here and there on sequencing. But um, I feel what we need today is um, this authentic data that we can correlate what we are doing mm -hmm. with. Andy, can you share? Yeah, yeah I mean, a, a lot of the really interesting things that we've been doing recently have been around uh, just driving greater adoption, right? Figuring out, um, particularly through the use of the EHR or population health uh, management tools, right? How do we get down to a cohort of patients where uh, a given test is going to be most impactful? Um, just thinking about that and working within the confines of what makes sense, right? Uh, healthcare, uh, you know, so sometimes when you get the, the Silicon Valley thought process, right, of move, move fast and break things, right, it just doesn't work in healthcare. Um, we have to work within the confines of kind of what health systems do and how they think. Um, and so finding some effective partners uh, within that population health management um, space who understand how health systems are making the decision of, you know, these are the screening tools that we use and this is how we drive greater adoption. I think there have been some, some really mm -hmm. interesting discussions that we've had recently. And, and I think that's, I mean, tests are going to continue to evolve, but driving greater adoption, mm -hmm. right? The best test is the test that gets used. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think there's some really interesting stuff to be done there. Yeah. Mm, that's a great point, <clears throat> bringing it to standard of care mm -hmm. at the end of the day, yeah. yeah. Well, for myself at uh, Medtronic, um, I think I shared earlier there that uh, 
Medtronic tends to think of things as, in terms of organic investment and inorganic investment, but uh, we've been experimenting with something that's in between, a bit of a hybrid. And the bit of the hybrid is um, what I'll call the intentional spin-out, um, partnered with uh, 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 certain VCs to help raise money and actually identify you know, who are the people that could do the work. So in this particular example, um, we took a technology that was sort of resident in our cardiac division. Um, so it's cryoablation technology. And it was interesting to our lung health group um, to do COPD uh, targeted lung denervation. And um, uh, we formed a, a company called Rhyme Medical. And this was partnered with uh, the Fogarty Institute. So Fogarty's responsibility there was to identify the talent and bring, bring in the VC partners to uh, actually make that, par uh, that partnership real. Going on, oh. Ashkin, can you share with us your worst experience executing a strategic partnership? Or you have to think. Uh, no, no. <laughs> They're I, all good? Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> I'm trying to think, think the most, uh, th th that's most substantive answer to that, um, I think, I don't know if you can call a worst experience, but it's a different mindset, right? When a company, a smaller company, a startup, they're very agile, and I'll use Steve Jobs' uh, you know, analogy here, uh, from pirates to Navy, right? Uh, a smaller company, everyone puts on the hat, it's survival, uh, everyone wants to do, you know, whatever it takes to be successful. And they're creative, and that's why they did what they did. And they're bold, and they take risk. But then when you acquire, when you come to Medtronic or J&J, &J, where I used to be, or, or Roche, um, it becomes very you know, slow-moving, bureaucratic sometimes, and very regimented, this rule, that rule. It becomes very hard for them. So it's a cultural thing. However, if you take that and move them slowly into keep their creative side, keep their innovative side, and again, since we're in a regulated industry, you just can't keep doing whatever. You know, you, you have to move into a more defined, more disciplined space. That's where, um, you know, sometimes a nightmare comes because <laughs> they hate you because they're like, we were so much better, we don't want to be this, and, and you have to kind of, you know, give them space, you have to kind of give them respect, and yet tell them the benefit of this. And also on this side, manage your management and say, things are moving, so don't worry about it, you know? So it's, it's, it's the balance that you have to create to ensure the integration. It's easier to acquire a company and very difficult to integrate. And this, whoever integrates well is successful. And so, you know, people don't understand the impact of change management. It's more like acquire and you know, somehow scientists will work with each other. There's change management process there. So I feel like that's really, really important and that's where you, know, you can prevent a nightmare. Yeah, okay. we've, we've definitely seen some of that with, uh, with some of our acquisitions where we're not, uh, we're not nearly as big as, as Roche is, right? But you're always, regardless of the size of the companies, you're gonna have yeah, some, some, cultural, uh, some cultural issues, right? Yeah. Where I think with our most recent uh, acquisitions, we've done a little bit better job of letting them live over there and just slowly boil the frog, as it were. <laughs> um, and it, look, but at a certain point, you have to say, all right, you're moving over to Workday. You're moving over to you know our our mm -hmm. ways of working, and and so you know it's it's almost always painful, but uh, I think we're <laughs> we're getting a little bit better at it. Well, I'll share my worst experience is mm -hmm. actually an embarrassment mm -hmm. <laughs> on that. Um, it was actually uh, uh, having negotiated, a, I'll say, a data sharing agreement with a large um, um, hospital organization. Um, you know, and after, I'll say, um, 12 months plus of, uh, you know, contract negotiations between their lawyers, our lawyers, and the constant, uh, you know, I'll just say cycle that you go through, and finally getting signature on that, 
and getting the very first piece of um, pseudo data for our scientists to kind of look that it was, uh, you know, in the format that was usable that we could do our data analysis on and that. The next day, getting a divorce letter um, from, <laughs> you know, the mutual out there and um, I was wondering why did this suddenly um, exercise the divorce clause. And I get on the phone there and the, uh, the new lawyer on that reviewed uh, the patient consent forms and said that no patient gave consent to a third party. And that was the end of the <laughs> year about day. Oh. Yes. Mm. And so I don't know what the wow. lesson learned there is, but you know, you make some assumptions when you enter in that, but yeah. um, <laughs> not one. necessarily everything has been taken care of. Yeah, totally. Yes. How about your best experience? Boy. <laughs> uh, well, you, you know, we, we make so many bets that are uh, that go out years into the future, right? Mm -hmm. um, we are still uh, we're still burning cash, unlike my uh, my counterparts here on the I should say utilizing cash. My CFO would want me to say, um, and so it, it's uh, I feel like there are there are little victories that we celebrate along the way, mm -hmm. um, you know, integrating well, getting you know integrating the tests well, uh, but ultimately we're gonna be judged on the basis of the, the financial results that we put forth, and so it, it's a little early to say in, <laughs> with regard to some of those. Yeah. How about Roche? Uh -huh. yeah. That's, I'm, I'm scratching my head. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know. Never have a great um, experience. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, like, it, it's a journey, right? It's a journey, it's, it's never like, and, and, and I feel it's our partnership is our accountability also. So big company thinks we have acquired a small company and now you know we have the we have all the money and we have all the power. I feel like it's it's partnership and each one has to um, you know play respectfully and work with you. respect the intellectuals that you have just acquired, right? So um, great example. Um, I, I can't think of anything that's so black and white. It's, it's always been you know, things to do. And I think this, the more you understand what you need to do up front and acknowledge that and be honest about it, then you can have a game plan. What happens is when you're in denial and you have assumptions and you just uh, keep doing what you think is right and hoping something will just work out, it doesn't work out. It doesn't matter if you're a big company. It doesn't matter you have to work together as partners and then understand and then have open, honest discussion, create a plan and execute to it and hold each other accountable. So I feel like my best successes have been when we have treated a smaller partner with dignity, that's really made, made it work. And it wasn't because they were such a great acquisition that everything just, it's because we also held ourselves accountable and we also treated them with the respect they deserve. In that case, they become true partners and they work with you. That's where what my experience has been. Mm -hmm. Even supply chain partners, you know? We say, oh, we are big, big, when I was at Medtronic or big j, j or this and that. You know, it, it doesn't help. They know we are big j, j or big Roche. It doesn't help throwing that weight around. It helps like, how do we work together? What is that we can do to help you in a win-win situation, right? So those are the partnerships that have worked well when we have been cognizant and, and also accountable for what we do with them. Yeah. So Andy, uh, when you make a strategic uh, investment in a life sciences company, do you have a minimum set of must-haves, you know, those boxes that have to be checked for you to execute a deal? You know, it, it really differs. Uh, every deal differs, mm -hmm. right? Um, we've gone through different exercises where, you know, uh, a leader will come in and they'll say, we want every, every deal to be evaluated on these couple of, um, and it just doesn't work that way, right? Mm -hmm. um, I feel like you need to, to recreate um, the check boxes for everything. Um, and so it's really about creating optionality for the future, existing within the, you know, the confines of, of the money that we have available for, for making some of these bets. Um, 
And I, I think the biggest thing, you guys touched upon this before, but it's just that cultural element, right? Um, I think if, if it's, uh, <laughs> being a, a company that's, that's based in Wisconsin, right? We, uh, I think we get some of those like down home values, right? Where it's like, if, if people are being a little over the top, um, if people aren't being humble about what they're trying to accomplish, mm -hmm. Like, I, I just don't know that there's a whole mm -hmm. lot to discuss. Um, but beyond that, I would say it, we really evaluate it on the basis of the individual deal. Yeah. Perhaps, Neil, for Roche? Yeah, for, for Roche, like you said, every deal is different, and every business uh, development, it depends on the culture of the business development uh, you know, organization. To Roche has so many of them. Um, I, I believe in creating a... Um, risk assessment and risk management. And that transparency in understanding risks is my biggest checklist. Because everyone will window dress, everyone will try to oversell, everything is great, and that's why you get in partnership because you think it's a winning proposition. But you know, having those authentic discussions about what are the true risks. Let's be honest, it's not a deal breaker, but at least we'll understand what to do, what we need to do, rather than be surprised. So that deep discussion about risk, how are we gonna mitigate that, what are the red flags, how would we know that we are coming closer to a risk? You know, what are the indi early indicators of risk, like inflation, right? What are the early indicators? What's going on? And establish that, that gives me a lot of comfort because then I know it's, it's, a, it's a really something that I can work through. But um, if everything is great, 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 you know, that actually scares me. And so my checklist is largely focused on having an authentic discussion about risks and then creating a plan to mitigate mm -hmm. them. Well, at Medtronic, I think um, it's rather simple, at least uh, I'll say to get that first tier by, there's one box that needs to check. And that says, um, does this fit into an existing strategic plan? So I was talking about that strategic plan every year and so forth. And this was really to um, uh, provide some governance that we uh, don't come across as being opportunistic. Um, you know, it, it's something that we truly is strategic and, and ties back to our strategic plan. So I'm looking here at the clock. We've got about 10 minutes left. And I was going to say, let's have some open mic. Um, okay. so does Can anyone... I ask you a question? Sure. What if your strategic plan changes? Which it changes. Well, see, we, we update it on an annual basis, right. there, so it, in six months. Right. So then mm -hmm. it's, uh, remember I was talking about time and distance and so forth in that introduction. So yeah. you have now the opportunity to go and influence the strategic plan. Part of getting something into your strategic plan, you are doing um, also say some basic uh, business modeling mm -hmm. and kind of elements and mm -hmm. you know we were talking about how do you de-risk mm -hmm. and all those mm -hmm. things all come into play mm -hmm. and that, that's kind of where you get to that second tier. Mm -hmm. So open mic, anyone got a burning question? If you do, come on up to the podium. Come on, no silent awkward moments here. Yeah, or just from wherever you are, I think we should be able to hear you. We answered everyone's questions there. <laughs> Go ahead. All right, so I hear this a lot when you say you just have a plan five, ten years out, right? Or mm -hmm. even whatever the year extension is. But you have to make that plan you necessarily tell the what specifically. So how does a startup company or an early stage technology who wants to you know partner with you um, understand your plan to take and maybe match up with that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, on one side, uh, I'll just give the guidance. If there's a particular area, um, let's say cardiology as an example, um, what are the trends in car cardiology? You know, what, how is practice, uh, the practice of medicine and cardiology changing? What, what are the trends there? And I'm gonna go and say, if you can actually plug into things like that, you're plugging into some of the drivers of our strategic plan. So when you think about it, even though it's not actively shared, you can think what that plan is. And, and, and then that sort of is your, um, I'll say your license to talk and introduce yourself and say how you think this is going to be um, intersecting with the practice of medicine with a particular group. Next question. How do you 
Well, all the above. Yes. <laughs> all the above. It all depends, right? What stage things are at. Yeah. Yeah. Data That's sharing. Um, yeah, I, I think there are a lot of different ways that you could just mm -hmm. sharing sharing of resources in one mm -hmm. way or another. Yes. Yeah, no, great question. And I came out of Medtronic, I did that. You know, it was, and I always used to say, what's so magical about end of the year? That we have to change our strategic plan, right? If something's going right, keep doing it. it bring it to fruition. Why in January we got our, actually our strategic plan is April, like whatever the month is, it doesn't matter. Like why should it shift, right? Which means we did something wrong all year <laughs> round and then now comes a date and like voila, you know, no. So in, in Roche, fortunately, um, it's it's a little better, we not a little better, quite a bit better, um, and and we continue those projects. So when you left Medtronic, ah, <laughs> you know, I tell you guys, this is a declaration forever. I love Medtronic. It is it flows in my I was saying flows in my blood because such a mission centric company. I think what I am today, Medtronic had a big role to play in that. I'm just taking those learnings and applying them wherever I go, but my foundation was Medtronic, and I love Medtronic, absolutely. But this AOP part, <laughs> I should say and the AOP part versus, but it bothers you too, right? It was, it was ridiculous, <laughs> really. But at Roche, fortunately, if you start something and it has meaning, we continue that. And then we look at, and we do a lot of agile um, teams and agile work we have incorporated. So, you know, instead of projects, we have agile release trains, and we do projects, of course, under the umbrella of projects, we do that. So we keep accomplishing things, but we, we stick to it most of the time, unless, you know, your strategic, your, your competitive environment has changed, or something major has happened, or you're the technology disruptor, you don't want to just continue doing it, right? So we make the decision, go, no, go, continue, et cetera. But by and large, we continue. Because if we change every year, how, how do you even make progress, right? Because at the end of the people are then posturing to save their projects. People are saving their jobs, you know? It becomes such a negative, healthy, and un unhealthy environment. Instead of focusing on making progress on the programs, the whole battle shifts on survival, and that's not good for anyone, right? So I'm really grateful, and that's one thing we could improve on. But in spite of that, what Medtronic's contributed to humanity is tremendous. I mean, they are game changers, they're innovators. They created the cardiac pacing world, they created neuromodulation, I can go on. But if they improve that, imagine what that could be. But I'm really blessed right now. I don't have to deal with that at Roche. It's yeah. really done well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I'm just going to say there's um, maybe a counterpoint to that. <laughs> um, the, the annual refresh of a strategic plan, um, when you start to think about the pace of change and integrating that and acknowledging it, um, we'll just say that the pace of change is always getting faster and faster and faster. So is that healthy? to actually have an annual refresh. And, and I think that's maybe part of the justification that we have for it. Yeah, the, <laughs> the one thing that I'll add is uh, we also do a long-term plan, which has kind of a roughly five-year uh, time horizon, which is litigated much less uh, and changes a lot less from year to year. So we end up going a little bit more based on, based on that than things that are changing mm -hmm. from year to year. Other question? Yeah. <laughs> uh, we get, um, speaking for myself, I get tons of just things over the transom via LinkedIn or people cold calling me or sending me an email. Uh, you know, I would say 
generally speaking, if you can find one email address at a company that you want to talk to, you can guess at what the, what the, and you can find out what the person's name is, right? It's A. Muller at Exact Sciences, <laughs> you know? It's pretty straightforward. So um, I, I would say I get a ton of those and I read them all. Um, some of them I dismiss more quickly than others, but uh, I would say pretty much anybody in our role is used mm -hmm. to getting those and, and would give them at least a quick look. And I'll give a little tip uh, too. If you're thinking about uh, Medtronic, uh, we subscribe to something I call the MedTech Triangle. And by that, I'm just saying that um, you know, fundamentally, a MedTech company is a commingling of three essential strands of DNA. So there's a technology component, there's a business component, and there's a clinical component. And if you can talk that language of those three elements that are coming together, um, you know, from the technology as opposed to just a pure uh, technology lens, um, I'll say that you have a step up over everyone else. I agree. Are we getting the hook? <laughs> uh, I agree. I agree. You know, having the business case um, and understanding reimbursement, market access, adoption, even if it's not there, but you have thought through it and there's a plan, even if it's a straw man, that goes a long way. That shows that you're looking at things comprehensively, you know. And we're out of time. We could talk for hours. Yes. We are out of time. <laughs> so we could have this conference for the entire length of Bioscience Week. We have so many amazing speakers. Let's thank our speakers. Thank you. Thank you.